Good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. Today we are leaving the Mississippi Blues Trail and we are heading towards Nashville and we're gonna make a stop along the way. I wanna do a vlog today on a great comedian, the great Miss Minnie Pearl. And so we are gonna be stopping off in her hometown of Centerville, Tennessee, Grinder Switch. And we're gonna take a look around there. There's something very interesting to see there. And then we're gonna continue on to her grave. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. So we're starting out today in Holly Springs, Mississippi. And this is the showing the sons of Junior Kimbrough over here. Sons and friends of Junior Kimbrough and Cotton Patch Soul Blues Boys. This has about as old town feel as you can get. I love it. Here in downtown, they have the Ida B. Wells Barnett Museum, famed African-American journalist, educator, suffragette, and human rights activist. Here's the Holly Springs Courthouse. You hear the bells going off. Right here in downtown, they also have a historic blues trail sign. Hill Country Blues, although Delta Blues often claims the spotlight, other styles of blues were produced in other regions of Mississippi. In the greater Holly Springs area, musicians developed a Hill Country Blues style characterized by few chord changes, unconventional song structures, and the emphasis on the groove or a steady driving rhythm. In the 1990s, this style was popularized through recordings of local musicians R.L. Burnside and David Jr. Kimbrough. Well, howdy, Tennessee. I'm awful proud to be here. We're taking the National Bird Dog Highway through Tennessee to Centerville. Co-pilot sleeping away. Literally, I could just hear him over here snoring. This also had us kind of passing right through where Buford Pusser and all the walking tall stuff happened, but the museum that his cars and all of his memorabilia are in is only open like two or three days a week and this wasn't one of them, so we'll do that in the future. I know I say it a lot, but it, it definitely rings true. Right now we're traveling on Route 18 and you just, the fun in getting to travel with open roads and the back road, seeing things that you normally wouldn't see, the places that your mind wanders. It, it's so much fun. I keep seeing signs for Jackson. I just keep thinking of that song. I'm going to Jackson. All right, entering Jackson. Oh, that's a cool railroad mural here in Jackson. Oh, beautiful. Take a look at that. Mini Pearl Memorial Parkway leading right to her town. So she would always talk about Grinder Switch. That was on the outskirts of Centerville. And now, you know, at the time there was really nothing other than just like a, a railroad crossing. Now it looks like there's a winery out there. But I'll tell you when we get out here a little bit why she would always talk about Grinder Switch instead of Centerville. All right, we finally made it. After about four hours of driving, we have found Centerville. Now let's go find this tribute to Minnie here in town. Welcome to the hometown of Sarah Ophelia Colley, also known as Minnie Pearl. Now this town is uh, very small, and it was very small even back then. The significance of this really is that her family, her father owned the lumber mill here in town. And that was really what was the main business for the town when she was born and growing up in the 20s. Now, actually the teens and the 20s. Look at that. Look who's sitting right here. Howdy. Yep, she grew up in this town and we would know her as being kind of like an old 
country down home simple woman but you know she was just playing a character Minnie Pearl was a character that she ended up inventing throughout her life when she was a little girl her sisters loved watching her perform and they used to just constantly want her to sing and tell jokes and things so she was basically growing up a little ham and she didn't know that she was kind of plain she wanted to be an actress when she was growing up and then one day she heard some people that were visiting the house mention that to each other that she was a plain little girl and so she decided that since she was funny and she knew she was funny she was going to focus on comedy but she had a dream of going to the american academy of dramatic arts in new york when she graduated from high school and she wanted to end up on broadway so unfortunately, even though her family, they didn't have a lot of money, they weren't like super wealthy, but for the town, they were pretty well off. They were the first family in town that had electricity. They were the first family in town that had indoor plumbing. Uh, they were the first family in town to have a automobile, even though her father was, he was older than her mother by like 20 years. He didn't trust cars and didn't want one. He only trusted the horse and buggy, but he wanted his wife to have the best so he bought her a really nice car and uh, and he would only go places if he was driven around so she ended up because of the great depression happening it took a toll on the lumber mill and they couldn't afford to send her to new york so she ended up staying in nashville and going to school there for drama and honestly i'm such a person that believes everything happens for a reason and i believe that happened for a reason instead of being a serious dramatic actress or even maybe a comedian on Broadway, we would have never had the, the country stylings of Minnie Pearl without the path that she took because she ended up going to Ward Belmont for school and her teacher there, she ended up saying was one of the most influential people in her life and that it was really one of the reasons she was so good at what she did. Now when she came out of school, she came back to this town she didn't have the money to go to New York, and in those days, you, when you were just 21, 22, you didn't go do something like that. And so she came back to this town and opened up a performing arts school here that was, I guess, somehow tied in with the, the school in town, the high school. So she would do performances locally here for the next year and a half, almost two years before she would end up getting a nice opportunity to go to Georgia and start working for a company called the Sewell Company. Now what the Sewell was, was this was a company that um, this lady was writing her own plays and she would find women in the South that were willing to basically become teachers. They would train you on how to be a director and teacher of her plays and then they would find you gigs across the rural South and would send these girls out basically with a big trunk full of costumes and the girls would go to the town, cast the local townspeople as the actors and then wouldn't even be given a place to stay, no money for that or anything from the school. They actually had to find a family in town and they would have to stay with the family and they would do chores and everything by day to eat and you know whatever to, because these people didn't have a lot of money during this time when, uh, Sarah, or she would actually go by Ophelia, when she was going out and doing all this stuff, she did it for seven years. These people didn't have, a lot of them didn't have movie theaters in their town. They didn't have access to radio. So something coming to their town like this was a big deal. So for seven years, she traveled all over the South and she would stay with these families and she would meet these families, hear all of their stories and hear all of their jokes. and that during that time she actually said that was the hardest time in her life that was the hardest work she ever did even when she was on Hee Haw and the Grand Old Opry and everything doing that seven years of touring around and directing those she got had a lot of work but she said that basically that was what created the character of Minnie Pearl by the end of basically the 30s the Soul Company was their plays were outdated and people had access to movie theaters and radio now so 
basically she was out of a job and came back here again to her hometown of Centerville and started trying to do a little bit of the uh, performing arts teaching again. But she would do occasionally for different benefits in town this character of Minnie Pearl. She used the two names, Minnie and Pearl, because those were very common rural South names. And she put together, you know, a couple of minutes worth of these funny down home jokes. And she went out to like a thrift store and bought, you know, what would be a Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening, nice fancy dress and got everything that would be part of her costume. Sometimes she would wear a bow, but then eventually she was known for that hat with the price tag, but that was actually an accident, that whole price tag thing. So she came back here and was performing, just trying to make ends meet and figure out what her next move was. And she got hired to do the mini pearl bit for a banker's luncheon that was here in town. And one of the bankers saw her when he went back to Nashville, he told his friend that worked for WSM, which was the Opry radio station. And next thing you know, Minnie Pearl had an audition to hopefully become a member of the Grand Ole Opry. And right across the street over here, they have another little piece to Minnie Pearl. Let's check that out. They have her as part of the Tennessee Music Highway Pathways. They have basically her whole story right here talking about how she was born here and raised here in Centerville in 1912, the youngest of five daughters. Now there's another statue of Minnie here, but not your ordinary statue. Let's go take a look at that. Oh wow, look at that giant Tennessee Volunteers tea, the big orange tea over there. And what we're gonna see now used to actually be right there on the front lawn of the courthouse where we were just at until they moved it to its current location. Right over this bridge. So right off the road at the Hickman Springs turn, you have <laughs> mini pearl up there, like a mini pearl Mount Rushmore made out of chicken wire. Look at that up there. That sucker is actually eight feet tall. Local artist named Ricky Pittman is making six different ones of Mini Pearl for the town. And that's the first one that he completed. The Mini Pearl miniature rose, the roses in this bed are dedicated to the memory of Mini Pearl. The rose, which was introduced by the American Rose Society in 1982, was to honor the Centerville native and Grand Ole Opry star, Cousin Minnie Pearl. How cool is that? I absolutely love stuff like this, especially just as you're riding down the road and you look off to the side and you see that, how cool. Now let's go out and find Grinder Switch. Talk about that. And let's talk about how Minnie's career really took off. We're not going today, but because uh, we've went before, but if you go inside the Ryman Auditorium where the Grand Ole Opry was, there is actually a Minnie Pearl and Roy Acuff statue inside. If you keep your eyes open, they'll tell you how to get there. Looks like this road that I turned on is called Lower Ships Bend, if you're coming out here. One of the reasons she even knew about it out here was because her father's lumber mill was out this way. Hey, look what we found. They have a water tower. So out here you'll see a fallen down building, a couple of pieces of farm equipment, and a sign that says Grinder Switch 1940. That's because that's the year that Minnie Pearl auditioned to be part of the Grand Ole Opry. Now she went there and had a sparse crowd and did three minutes they invited her back, which was a good sign. They didn't make her a member yet, but they invited her back. And when she came back the following week, she found out that she had 300 letters of fan mail already, just after a one-time performance of three minutes. So the Grand Ole Opry ended up making her a member. She was then getting paid 
ten dollars a week which a pretty big deal because that whole seven years that she was teaching doing the Sewell stuff she was making ten dollars a week there so here she was making it just in one night what she used to make before and then as she performed Mr. Roy Acuff saw her perform and asked her to join his road show. So Roy Acuff was pretty much like the embodiment of country music during that time, especially for the Grand Ole Opry. So for him to invite her out was a big deal, but she was worried because she, you know, this was just a character she did occasionally that she was now, you know, turning into something. She only had three minutes of material and he wanted her to fill 20 minutes. So she started doing these shows. Basically he would pay her $50 a week and they would go tour through the week all over, you know, around the South and the vicinity, a couple hundred miles away from Nashville. And then they would have to be back on Saturday for the Grand Ole Opry. So she was making $50 a week there and $10 from the Grand Ole Opry. That's pretty good money for her, but she wasn't really going over well with the crowd. She didn't have 20 minutes worth of material and Roy Acuff ended up having to let her go. So her and her sister sat down and wrote a bunch of jokes so that they would have all this material and uh, the next time that she was invited to go out and perform, go on a tour, she was ready and was really wowing audiences. So I mentioned that her time as the director for Sewell was very important. That's because that's where all the characters that she would end up talking about and the stories and everything would come from. One of the families that she lived with while she was out doing that in Alabama the woman was very much like Minnie Pearl. She was extremely funny, but didn't know it. And that's something that Ophelia saw in her and she decided to kind of use that as the basis for Minnie Pearl. And then would use, that woman actually had a grown son with some uh, mental handicap that his name was Brother. And so that's where the character of Brother came from. She didn't want to use Centerville. She used, um, this because she didn't want people in Centerville to think that she was making fun of them. She was, she really appreciated the country people. She didn't want them to think that she was doing anything bad. And at the time, Grinder Switch didn't have anybody living here. It was really just like a crossover. So she thought that was probably the safest name to give it. So that became her fictional town and all of her relatives she would talk about would be from here. And thus Minnie Pearl was born. One night she came out in that custom getup that she had, that nice Saturday dress and her shoes and everything and her handbag. And she was wearing a new hat that she had got and put the flowers on top. And as she was performing, the price tag that she forgot to take off the hat popped down and people got a good laugh out of it. So that became one of her trademark pieces of costuming. So now let's head to Nashville and we are gonna go visit her gravesite. Then I want to go check out her last home. All right, we got an hour till Franklin. Once Minnie became a member of the Opry, she performed every Saturday for 27 years. I just passed by this and I was like, that sounds familiar. I remember reading an article about the Shindig Ranch a couple of years ago. So I went back and reread it to see why it sparked my memory. The, I don't know if he still lives here, but the guy that used to live here was the owner of the New Orleans Pelicans, but he also had a massive like antique car collection. And one of the things that he had that he was like real proud of was he had the Warren Beatty car that was shot up for the Bonnie and Clyde movie. Used to be here. All right, we have arrived. Franklin, Tennessee. This is Mount Hope Cemetery. I didn't even see a sign identifying it when we came in. We're looking for Section K. All right, here's Section K, and just right from here, I can see her. See that big tree over there? If you look right there, the name Cannon is on the headstone. That's her married last name. So right here on the opposite side of what I was just showing you, you'll see four headstones. Hers is right here. Does not say her stage name, of course. Not gonna find that out here. You'll find her real name, Sarah Ophelia Coley Cannon. Right next to her husband. See, she passed away in 
1996. Nice long life. Right there next to her husband. Her husband was apparently just an absolute riot. People say that he was one of the funniest people that anyone had ever met. He, he was the kind of guy that would say something extremely off the wall for a laugh and say it with a completely deadpan expression. And uh, they would say that she thought he was so funny that she wanted him to become a performer. But he was actually a... He was, at the time they met, he was in the military as a pilot. He then started a charter service with someone else. And the more she did road gigs, because once she was doing the Opry, even though she didn't have a successful trip doing the stuff with Roy Acuff, she eventually did. She got hooked up with something called the Camel Caravan and toured for like 18 months straight. And that was all during the week when she wasn't doing the Opry stuff. And she loved that life. She absolutely loved being a traveling performer. And even when she married him, at first she quit performing, like she quit traveling and only did the Opry, but she missed it after a year. So he basically started just flying her everywhere. And he became like a charter pilot to the stars. He would fly her quite a bit. Hank Williams, senior a lot, Elvis. They had a wonderful marriage. You can even see he passed away shortly after her, like six months after. So Minnie's career was amazing. We knew her from Hee Haw, of course the Grand Ole Opry, countless live performances, and her trick was that she said, if you have a winning horse, you ride it till the end. And she viewed her character Minnie Pearl as being a winning horse. So she just, she kept all the same jokes, would write some new ones, but she people knew what to expect when they came to see her. She would pretty much give them what they wanted and performed for a long time. Her goal really was, everyone said, was once the Country Music Hall of Fame was established, she just secretly wanted to be in the Hall of Fame so bad. And year after year, she would attend the ceremony hoping that she was going to be the one announced to be inducted and finally in 1975 she was which is pretty amazing if you think about it because she was not a i mean to be in the country music hall of fame and to not really be a singer and not really be a country music performer she wasn't really known for that you know she she did some like dances and like comical songs and stuff but mainly she was a comedian so quite a quite a feat to be in the Hall of Fame. So she performed on Hee Haw for 50 years, but 27 consecutively. She performed on there from 1940 till 1991, and then was on Hee Haw from 1969 to 1991. She just always loved being on television. They always worked around her character, and she never did anything else. She never broke the character. You know, she never... As an actress, she saw this as like, this is who I am. I'm not going to deviate and, and try anything else. So that's why she was so successful. So sadly, she battled cancer, um, had to have a double mastectomy. And eventually, the, the um, hospital that was treating her, she became a spokesperson for them as herself. Not as many Pearl, but as herself. And then in 1991, the reason that she had to quit performing doing anything with the Opry is because she suffered a stroke and that just, that ended all of that. She eventually ended up living in a retirement home and, uh, or a nursing home. A lot of country music superstars would come visit her there, but she ended up passing away at the age of 83 years old from what they believe was a second stroke, complications from a second stroke. Now to our last stop. It looks like it's in a town called Live Oak. Well, good grief, Jaws. Is that how we're going to live today? All right, we made it over to Curtiswood Lane where she lived, also where the governor's mansion is. So it looks like, it looks like this is the governor's mansion.
Well, way up on that hill was the last home of Minnie Pearl. Kind of amazing what a long career in country music can do for you. Lived here until 1991. Of course, like I said, when she went into the nursing home. Now, I'd heard that about 10 years ago, one of the members of the Oric family, the vacuum family, had bought this house. And then the last thing I saw was, I believe one of the Kings of Leon, one of the Followell brothers, I think they bought it and they own it now. Minnie Pearl's last home, wow. Well, my friends, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed our day exploring the life of Minnie Pearl. I thought it was really awesome to get to see her hometown and the statues and <laughs> grinder switch and her grave, her house, everything. This was a lot of fun for me and I hope it was for you. If you, uh, if you weren't familiar with Minnie Pearl, go look her up. I think you'll get a lot of laughs. She had some really funny jokes, like really funny <laughs> jokes. They were, uh, they were worth your time. Very uh, kind of like country jokes, but I loved them. Thank you all for watching. If this is your first time here, please hit the subscribe and the notification bell, and we'll see you all next time. Have a great night, and goodbye. <laughs>